Good afternoon. I'll show you some uh, examples of this future of the landscape. If the keynote is working, yes. Can we switch to the screen? This is the Afsluitdijk, a famous 32 kilometer dam built by hand in 1932. And basically this kind of infrastructure allows the Netherlands uh, to not die, eh? to not drown. So on the left you have the sea, and on the right you have Rotterdam, Amsterdam, the other cities. So it's very interesting. For more than a thousand years we've been living with nature, we've been fighting with nature, we have tried to find a notion of harmony. And somehow, somehow there's a sort of madness in it. Eh? We, we, we use technology, we use design to create our own home. My Chinese friends are saying, you're crazy, eh? just, just move to Germany. Eh? Ooh, who fights against water? But we don't. And so I think this is sort of a symbol in a way of how tech can integrate into our lifestyle. But sometimes even the Dutch forget. And that's why we made Waterlicht, what you see here. A combination of LEDs and lenses which show how high the water level would be if we stop. If we don't invest in new ideas, if we take life for granted. And we started to flood these public spaces all around the world. Best wel spooky. <laughs> Spacey. Ja. Wat ik het gevoel dat ik erbij krijg is een beetje onder water. Dat je onder een, een, een laag zit. Ja, best wel mooi, vind ik. With the waves above us. And it's, it's magnificent. Ik weet natuurlijk dat we beneden de zeeniveau zitten. Maar ja, zoals je het zegt, zou dat uh, niet zo fijn zijn als ik dit opeens over me heen ga voelen. Nee. So some were a bit scared, most of them were curious. 60,000 people showed up in one night. So it's very, very interesting in what happens when tech jumps out of this computer screen and sort of creates a collective experience where people are not afraid but more curious towards the future. What I like a lot, and we've been traveling around the world, we've done it in New York, Toronto last week, next week in Dubai. Very interesting how the people react. And I love that, in a way, there's a notion of, of wonder. Eh? People are like, oh, this is our world. What, what, what do we want to do with this rising sea level? But what is also very interesting, if you allow people a certain space, eh? a physical space, this public space, but also a mental space, people start to occupy it. They start to personalize it. This is what happened last week. <laughs> Not actor, eh? People started to dress up as mermaids and sort of hang out, or I have no idea how they got there actually, but, uh, or, or, or here, um, Daft Punk came and recorded their new video, you know, so it's very, very interesting the notion of moving away from the screen and using public space to create interactions which are more human, more meaningful and definitely more creative. Um, I like that a lot. How can we combine this, this, this new dream of clean air, of clean water, of clean energy into the world of today? These are floodgates, very historical floodgates. They, they lower and, and um, uh, they rise the walls of water. Again, if these fail, we all die in the Rotterdam, in the Netherlands. And we were commissioned to highlight these very important, famous, iconic buildings. And we wanted to work with light and technology and sound and interaction, but we realized that all current tech, the microchips, the sensors, the LEDs, would die as well because of the salt and the rain. So we had to look at what is already there. And of course we realized there's already light there, which is the light of the... This is not be, me being rhetorical, please. <laughs> Hmm? Bioluminescence, yeah, very creative. What kind of light is there on the, on the highway? Street lights. Street lights, cars. Yes, very good, cars. That's very interesting. So we took 
the blueprints, eh, the famous sketch, this is actually designed by the grandfather of Rem Koha's in 1932, dragged our minister into the story. Eh? Usually politicians have no imagination, so you have to sort of tell them, show them. She was really cool, by the way, but she'll make zillions of prototypes, not as a VR, but as a physical model, mimicking the headlights of the car. And three years later, 324 people, this is daytime, and this is nighttime. So you can go there every night for free with your electric car, um, no battery, no solar panel, no maintenance, no energy bill. It's just using the headlights of the car to create this energy neutral planet. the micro prismas that we developed, eh, the reflectors. So why do we have streetlights burning the whole night eh, when nobody's there? <laughs> it's like really stupid. It consumes a lot of electricity, it's bad for the animals. And these sort of designs help to sort of merge these very traditional elements with very, very futuristic elements. It also solved the problem because this is in a nature reservoir, eh, so standard lighting was not allowed because of the light pollution and eh, the animals and the trees. So this is in a very simple and effective way, only shows lights when the cars are there. Yeah. And it sounds a bit stupid, but why, do, why, why don't you give light only when the people are there? So these kind of very primitive, simple ingredients, combined with radical thinking, create these kind of landscapes of the future, which I like to have. And this is public. This will be there for another 100 years, most likely. And the, rain, the rain will clean it. Um, this is how I like to see the future. And this is really important for me because um, we go back to the world of today, huh? uh, and that's this. Beijing, four years ago, I became inspired by Beijing smog. Huh? So the left, we have a good day, and the right, we have a bad day. You live five to eight years shorter. Children have lung cancer huh? because of the pollution. I almost start to smoke again just to feel healthy. Huh? It's like, ha, ah, it's like... And, and, and somehow the city has become a machine that is hurting us, you know, that is, that is hitting us. And London the same, eh? Oxford Street, 17 cigarettes per day that we passively inhale. Not good. So I think it's absurd and obscene that we're spending our love, time, energy, money on the cloud. Eh? Facebook, Twitter, WeChat, VR, perfect, beautiful. And somehow our physical world is crashing. Rising sea levels, CO2, air pollution, and we don't really care or we try to hide or whatever. I think we should stop creating sort of new realities and trying to connect realities within themselves or at least try to upgrade the physical world around us. So I was looking at my room four years ago and I became inspired by Beijing smog. And I'm not a scientist eh, or a mayor with 20 billion euro in green energy. You know, I'm a designer, I'm an engineer, I can make stuff. And I remember being a, being a boy playing with a plastic balloon uh, at these boring children parties uh, that, hey, that you have to go to. And when you polish a plastic balloon with your hand, it becomes static. Yes, thank you very much. Static electrified. It starts to play with your hair. What if we would use that principle to build the largest smog vacuum cleaner in the world? Yes, which sucks up polluted air, cleans it, and releases it. If the city has become a machine that hurts us, let's build a machine that can heal us. You know, why not? So a lot of people said it was not possible, not done. We ignored, one year later, we built the first one. So it cleans like a soccer stadium within one day, the PM 2.5, PM 10, running on solar panel and releasing the clean air. So we have parks which are 20 to 70% more clean than the rest of the city. What is interesting is government starts to call. China, Colombia, India, we're producing hundreds of them. But I want to share one story, because it's not just machines, it's also people. And in this case, animals. 
the opening of Krakow in Poland, one of the most polluted cities in Europe. I walked in the day of the opening, I walked to the, to the, to the venue and everything was ready. On the left you see Nick, the project manager. And as I walked to the tower, I saw tens, 20, 30, 40 of these little puppies right there. And it was like really weird. It was like this weird David Lynch movie I walked into, this sort of secret meeting I wasn't invited for. So I asked the project manager, what are these dogs doing here? And they look really happy. Eh? And the project manager was like, I don't know. Well, I'm like, well, let's find out. And so we did. And of course, we all know that dogs have a very high sense of, of smell. Eh? They, can, they can smell 20, maybe 200 times better than human beings. And so they were suffering from smog the most, and they have like tiny lungs, and they're very small, eh? so they, 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 they were suffering and they can't escape. And apparently they, they could smell the clean air from far, far away and abandon their owner and would sort of hang out around the tower. <laughs> it's a true story. And you know, they look really happy. You see here, this one? This, this one tries to be happy, but it's too small, yeah, so. But. So it's very interesting, is if, if nature is capable of figuring out what is good for, for them, why can humans not? Yes? And these are the, the, the sort, of, sort of gifts that you get as a designer. You have to look out for them, you have to learn from them and appreciate. It's not the scientific research that we also have, but it's a story which makes me happy and is also very convincing. Yeah. And we learn. This is Beijing smog. This is the stuff that we were sucking up from the urban skies. Eh? Again, this is in our lungs right now. Huh. Not good. I believe waste should not exist. Eh? Waste for the one, food for the other. Think as a circle, eh? like nature. 32% is carbon. Carbon under high pressure, you get, question number three, diamonds. Yeah, very good. So, we compressed it for 30 minutes eh? and started to make smog-free rings. By sharing a ring, you donate a thousand cubic meter of clean air to the city where the tower is in. And this changed everything. Kickstarter campaign. So the finance we made with the jewelry helped us to build the first tower. So suddenly the waste wasn't the problem, it was the activator. And, and we raised money to, to make the project happen. But besides the money, because money is everywhere, it's community, these are wedding couples. You can read the New York Times interview four weeks ago, where he proposes to her with the smog free ring. It's not actor, it's like a real couple because they didn't want a blood diamond, you know, they, they want to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. For them, clean air is the true beauty, yes? And uh, she said yes. And I checked with them two weeks ago, they're still married, they're sort of doing okay. <laughs> Somehow I feel responsible for this marriage. <laughs> Prince Charles has the cufflinks, and we put a little GPS in it, so. <laughs> so, so I think yeah, I know where Prince Charles is. That's like, uh, no, I don't, but it would have been great, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's technology, it's science, but it's also making it very personal, you know, making it shareable. And the moment you connect these two worlds, I think that's the way to create impact. All right. And it's opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. My latest project, and we start but with why Kennedy. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. In 1962, Kennedy had to defend its billion dollar uh, plan to go to the moon. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And this was the moment of euphoria. Eh? We, want, we explored, and it was beautiful. Um, but 60 years later, this is the result. Space waste, space junk, 8.1 million kilo of trash floating around our Earth. 
and nobody really knows how to fix it. I think it's obscene that we're not satisfied polluting our planet Earth, but we just keep on going outside our Earth atmosphere, you know? And it, it started in 1957, Sputnik, Apollo, pieces of, of satellites and missiles and rockets started to collide and created this layer of, of junk. And why? Why should we care? Eh? Why? Because it's like really far away. Well, if a tiny particle, because of its high speed, 25,000 kilometers per hour, hits an existing satellite, satellite goes down, eh? no more GPS. When we have the 5G, no more wired.com or UK, eh? no more Facebook. So although it's very far away, 20,000 kilometers up, it will affect our communication, eh? our, our, our intimacy in a way. And ESA, eh, the European Space Agency, is predicting that it's going to get worse. This is called the Kessler effect, that in 25, 30 years, there are so many particles that there's so, such a layer of junk that we cannot launch more mo new missiles anymore or rockets. Yes? So basically, we're trapped. So in 30 years, we'll have a conference here at the Wired saying, okay, guys, we've discovered life outside planet Earth. That's the good news. The bad news is we can't get there. <laughs> And that's the, real, that's the real story. That's what the space scientists tell me. I think that's not the world we want to live in. So this is my new fascination. We're launching the Space Waste Lab. Step one, visualization. Step two, cleaning it up. Step three, upcycling it. And I'll take you one minute to go through that. It's a 10-year-long program with ESA and NASA and some tech companies. Here you see points of space waste floating above your head, real time. Short movie. Thousands of particles are floating around in the universe. It's space waste, caused by us. Broken pieces of satellites and missiles. If we keep on polluting with space waste like this, the planet Earth will be surrounded by this layer of junk. What can we do with it? Is it a problem or the ingredient for something new? So we're scanning 29,000 particles real time, larger than 10 centimeters. We're pointing, we're visualizing, scanning the universe. 8,000 people at the opening ceremony. But also, we're sort of wondering, you know, what would you do with 8.1 million uh, Lego blocks? Eh? <laughs> because it's like when you were a boy or a girl, you don't want to clean up your room. Eh? You want to watch television and, and have an ice cream. Cleaning up is not fun, so we need to think it in a different way. Inside, we have an exhibition where the partners are showing a real piece of space waste from the Hubble telescope that an astronaut like, brought down to the ground. And we're thinking, what can we do with that? Can we capture it eh, with a net or a laser? Can we use it to make 3D print houses on the moon? Why not? Eh? It's already a resource. We shipped it there for billions of euros. Or if we somehow, somewhere, attract it to planet Earth, the moment it goes through the Earth atmosphere, it burns. So waste is light. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Can we create artificial falling stars as a replacement for polluting fireworks? This project will be the beginning or the end of world wars, by the way, I think. <laughs> like, so can we create artificial falling stars for Dubai 2020, the World Expo? Why not? So I think that's, ladies and gentlemen, how I would love to see the world. Technology jumping out of the screen, addressing new values which are beyond money or a Louis Vuitton bag. And I think if we start thinking like that about the world around us, um, there's still a lot to be explored. All right. Thank you. Yes.